Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us on our webinar today, uh, hosted by NEST and UNICEF to discuss the implementation toolkit for small and sick newborn care. This is part of the implementation learning um, seminar series that you you see the um, this the uh, the ad email address or the link to the um, site. Uh, the implementation learning series is a joint learning community between NEST 360 and the UNICEF Newborn Toolkit. The aim of the series is to encourage collaborative learning for the advancement of small and sick newborn care. The seminar, seminar series is linked to the Newborn Toolkit. You see the uh, links here on the slide. Today we are focusing on medical supplies and devices. Um, one of the eight cogs of the toolkit. Um, here you see the codes to sign up for the toolkit newsletter uh, in um, French, and you can follow us on Twitter, LinkedIn, and Facebook. Next slide, please. So today on July 25th, we are going to talk about medical supplies and devices focusing on newborns and caffeine. Next slide, please. My name is Dr. Leah Greenspan and the um, ignore uh, the introduction on this slide, please. And I am uh, a senior newborn advisor for USAID and a neonatologist, which makes me extremely passionate about making sure that babies uh, have access to safe uh, caffeine usage. Next slide, please. Um, our overview for our webinar today is. Um, we're going to run through the toolkit for medical supplies and devices, and we will. I will turn it over to Dr. Mambuza uh, now to take us through. Over to you. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, my name is Dr. Bozo Sipalo. Um, I will be showing the medical supplies and devices toolkit run through. And there's a video that will play now. I am a research assistant with the newborn implementation team at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. So I'll play the video now. This is the medical supplies and devices newborn toolkit run through. The purpose of this run through is to give newborn care workers and implementers a brief overview of what is found in the medical supplies and devices health system block. Additionally, it serves to be a navigating guide for newborn care workers and implementers to show where and how to find the latest guidelines in medical supplies and devices related to small sick newborn care, and that's helped in planning for newborn wards at different levels of care. So what we're looking at now is the homepage of the newborn toolkit website. We'll click on access toolkit. And now we're able to see the different health system blocks. The blue icon is for medical supplies and devices. We'll click on that. Now we're able to see overview, requirements, planning and management, operation and maintenance, and innovation. And across the page, we have overview, readings, tools, and learnings. It's important to note that each section has its own overview, its own readings, its own tools, and its own learnings. So now we'll look at requirements. There are different subheadings under this section, and we'll look at requirements for essential newborn technologies as an example. So the first thing that we do here is to show equipment required for each newborn care unit from primary to tertiary intensive care, which is done here. And then we also highlight different resources around the theme of essential newborn technologies. One of the resources highlighted here is the target product profile, which is a resource created by UNICEF and NEST360 to be a list of proposed set of performance and operational characteristics for 16 newborn products tailored for the lower resource setting on the themes of hydration and nutrition, drug delivery, jaundice, point of care, infection, respiratory support, and thermal management. So you can easily access this resource, which takes you to the UNICEF page where all the documents are easily downloadable to your device. Next, we'll look at requirements for essential newborn medicine. This topic is unpacked further on this section and different resources are highlighted, such as the WHO model list of essential medicines for children. We'll click on that. And this 
links us to a page where we can access the resource with the description of the resource and easily download the page from the WHO website. Furthermore, on this same section, we have oxygen therapy, which is essential for neonatal resuscitation and different neonatal conditions as it is a life-saving drug. And we do highlight different resources from different organizations such as UNICEF, PATH, USAID. One of the resources that will give an example to show is the WHO Access to Oxygen Initiative. We'll click on that. And we can also click on the Oxygen System Planning Tool. So the Oxygen System Planning Tool links you straight to the UNICEF page and the Oxygen Access Initiative links you to the WHO page where you can easily download it. So the Medical Supplies and Devices Health System Building Blog highlights the need to have adequate medicines, devices, and supplies, as well as preventive and corrective functional maintenance ecosystems for newborn care tailored towards the low resource settings. We invite all implementers in newborn care to join us in developing this resource to be a one-stop shop for implementers in newborn care to learn, act, and share together. Thank you. So our next speaker will be Dr. Osayame Ekagwere from Riley Hospital for Children from the Indiana University School of Medicine. Um, he will present on scene setting Caffeine for Neonatal Care, a brief overview of WHO recommendations and evidence. Good afternoon. Thank you for the introduction and for the opportunity to contribute to this important discussion today. My topic will be on caffeine for neonatal care, WHO recommendation and evidence. My topic will review the WHO recommendation on the use of caffeine for preterm infants and summarize the evidence guiding these recommendations. To quickly summarize, apnea prematurity is a cessation of breathing that lasts 15 seconds or longer with associated desaturation and bradycardia. Apnea prematurity is commonly a disease of prematurity. The more premature the baby is, the higher the risk of developing apnea prematurity. When severe, Apnea prematurity can lead to respiratory failure and even death. The hypoxia seen in apnea prematurity can be associated with the development of retinopathy of prematurity and poor neurodevelopment. Metals and things are the drug used to treat apnea prematurity. They work by competitively inhibiting adenosine receptors and stimulating the respiratory center. The major metals and things are oral or IV caffeine, or antiophilin, which is IV form being aminophilin. WHO have advocated for caffeine use for treating prematurity for a while now. In 2009, caffeine was first included in the WHO essential drug list. In 2020, it was included in WHO sick and small infant guideline. And in 2022, WHO made strong recommendations on the use of caffeine for treating preterm infants. The recommendations are as follows. Treat all preterm infants born less than 37 week gestation who have established apnea prematurity with caffeine. This was a strong recommendation with moderate certainty of the evidence. The second recommendation was for all infants born less than 34 weeks on a ventilator, caffeine should be used to aid extubation. This was a strong recommendation with moderate certainty of evidence. And then the third one was that for all infants born less than 34 weeks who are at risk of developing apnea prematurity, caffeine can be used to prevent the development of apnea prematurity. This was a conditional recommendation with low certainty of evidence. The evidence to support these recommendations originate from a Cochrane review that pulled the results from six trials. These trials compared caffeine to placebo or no methylxanthine at all. The study outcomes for these studies are listed here. With regards to mortality, there have only been three trials that included 154 patients and caffeine had no benefit in reducing mortality when compared to placebo. With regards to apnea prematurity, 
at discharge, there has only been one trial that included 43 patients, which also did not find any benefit of caffeine over placebo. With regards to ventilator use, there have been five trials, including 192 patients that showed caffeine is beneficial in reducing the number of days on the ventilator. The evidence was, however, of low certainty. With regards to chronic lung disease or prematurity, there have been one trial that include 805 patients that showed benefit with moderate certainty. One trial studied death or poor neurodevelopment at five years of age. The study enrolled 767 patients and showed no benefit of caffeine over placebo in reducing the combined outcome death or poor neurodevelopment at five years of age. I think it is important to, to note that while the WHO recommends Recommendation favors caffeine over other methylxanthine. Available evidence suggests that theophylline is equivalent to caffeine in preventing the incidence of apnea prematurity in preterm infants, as shown by these forest plots in this slide. While it is not stated explicitly in the WHO recommendation, the choice of caffeine over other methylxanthines could be because caffeine results in less side effects like tachycardia or feeding intolerance that require dosage changes compared to aminophilin. Caffeine does not require blood monitoring. It has a longer half-life, thus favoring daily dosing, and it has a wider therapeutic window. All of this would suggest that caffeine may be a better choice over theophylline or aminophilin. Despite the recommendations and existing evidence, research and clinical use gaps continue to exist in lower middle income country. And here is why. Most of the reference studies were conducted in resource replete settings where high quality neonatal care exists. As you can see from this list, Australia, Canada, France, United Kingdom, and the USA have been the key countries that caffeine has been studied in. Not all study outcomes apply to lower middle income countries at this time. For example, ventilators are not readily available in most lower middle income countries, and the incidence of BPD is low because at risk babies do not survive to develop BPD. So these outcomes may not be relevant for lower middle income countries at this time where the quality of care that's being provided is not equivalent to that seen in high income countries. I will also argue that the most important outcomes for low and middle income setting right now include mortality and the incidence of apnea prematurity. And as you can see from this slide, the number of studies evaluating these outcomes, the number of patients that have been studied for these outcomes and the quality of evidence are inadequate to answer that question in a lower middle income setting. Neurodevelopment is very important. However, the only trial that had examined the effect of caffeine over placebo was the CAP trial. The patient population, the treatment interventions, and other are not readily available in lower middle income countries. So the evidence is not easily transferable from high income country to a low income setting. In conclusion, caffeine is a safe and effective drug for preterm infants and WHO's recommendation will serve as an impetus for LMICs to adopt its use in clinical practice. However, the incidence to support caffeine use in lower middle income countries largely originates in high income countries, and this evidence may not translate to lower middle income countries, creating a research and clinical use gap that needs to be filled. The existing gaps create opportunity to study the effect of caffeine on preterm mortality, need for, and duration of non-invasive support, and the effect on long-term neurodevelopment. Again, thank you for the opportunity to contribute to this discussion. Great. Um I think that's me now. Um, hi, everyone. Um, my name's Andrew Storey. Um, I, um, I'm from the Clinton Health Access Initiative, CHI. And I'll be presenting on caffeine fit trade availability and pricing in selected countries. Um, oh, thank you.
Anyway. Excellent. Um, so last year, Trey um, commenced a project um, basically to follow up on precisely what you just heard in this presentation, the understanding that caffeine citrate is the WHO recommended drug. Um, and we tried to understand, first of all, uh, to what extent was it being used in lower and middle income countries? And where it was not being used, what were the barriers? What was preventing it um, from being scaled up? We undertook a landscaping um, to, to, to try to answer this question. Um, the landscaping took place across five countries, Ethiopia, several states in India, Kenya, Nigeria, and South Africa. And it was wide in scope. It was looking at policy level, um, uh, the policies in place, the awareness, the availability, utilization and price of the caffeine citrates within those countries. We engaged a large number of healthcare providers and various other stakeholders, professional associations, uh, the caffeine manufacturers themselves, and the distributors. And the slides we're going to see now are some of the main findings that came out of that work. Please, next slide. Um, what we found was that caffeine citrates was included in, in, in all of the national guidelines in the countries we, look, we were looking at. But the um, language, um, the national guidelines themselves, is not often aligned with that um, from the WHO, but nevertheless, it was there. Um, the difference would be in Ethiopia, when we started the work, actually, caffeine was not in the EML and was not in the national guidelines in the country. Um, but during the course of the project, the Ethiopian government updated this. Um, in South Africa, Ethiopia, and Nigeria, guidelines recommend the use of caffeine or, or amoxifiline. In Kenya, the treatment guidelines um, recommend AOP, sorry, treatment guidelines for AOP recommend the use of amoxifiline in instances where caffeine citrate is not available. And the Indian, in India, uh, the hospitals defer to the Institute of Medical Science. The, the, what, we, what we're really seeing here was a pragmatic approach. Um, gov government um, um, recommending and um, proposing the use of caffeine, but also being realistic in the sense of having a backup in place, an alternative in place um, in those instances, and there's unfortunately many instances when caffeine was not available. Could you move to the next slide, please? Um, we tried to speak to, well, we did speak to healthcare providers to understand what levels of caffeine citrate um, awareness there was, to what extent were healthcare providers aware that caffeine citrate was the WHO uh, recommended drug or the preferred drug. And we were pleasantly surprised by the level of awareness we experienced, particularly um, for those neonatologists and pediatricians working in situated in NICU settings. Across India and Nigeria, all of the healthcare providers we spoke to, that's 18 in India and 28 in Nigeria, had a good understanding of caffeine, the importance of caffeine and the preference for caffeine. Even in, in Ethiopia, a country where, as I said a moment ago, caffeine citrate was not included in the treatment guidelines until very recently, and where, quite honestly, it is nigh, it is nigh, well, so recently, it is nigh on impossible to actually access um, caffeine because legally it can't be imported or couldn't be imported. Even then, half the providers we, we spoke to understood um, the importance of caffeine citrate. And that would have been from their training and learning rather than from practical experience. Um, and then this, the levels of awareness dropped down to areas like South Africa, well, it's moderate um, to low. Could you move on please to the next slide? What we found was that facilities had used or did have experience of using caffeine citrate, with the exception of Ethiopia, as I just mentioned, you can get it. Um, but what, um, what, what was generally happening was that alternative and master finding was being widely, um, was what more widely known and widely used in these facilities. In India, this is a bit exceptional. Um, the levels of usage in India was found to be pretty high, in fact, very high, <laughs> 95%. Um, whilst um, the facilities using caffeine citrate in other countries, Kenya, South Africa, and Nigeria, fluctuated um, much more. If we move to the next slide, moving quickly, um, speaking to Ministry of Health officials, interviewing Ministry of Health officials, you know, again, we saw, you know, obviously, strong awareness for the product, um, strong support for the product. Um, and also concerns about using alternative products um, and understanding about the toxicity effects of alternative products. And this is something we came up heard in South Africa in particular, and something I think I was outlined in the previous presentation. 
But in all instances, there was uh, highlighting about the cost, the price of this product, how simply uh, it was just far too expensive, far too unaffordable, so, and putting caffeine the trait out of, re out of reach for, if not all, and certainly the vast majority of the population. I think it's interesting maybe to highlight that very last quote though in the bottom right hand corner coming from the Kenyan Ministry of Health because there was a, a realization, and I'm going to read this out, you know, that ca caffeine is a special drug. Um, and you know, the volumes for this drug, even the best case, are always going to be relatively low especially compared to other drugs that we might be able to mention. And from the Kenyan perspective, at least, and I think this is, well, we did hear similar noises from the government, there was understanding that you know, the, even at a relatively higher price, you know, the price was still relatively low compared to the overall cost of running a nuclear war, and a real and a, an appreciation that some form of price premium was uh, was possible. So paying some form of price premium um, for caffeine citrate was possible. The question was just what level of price premium could be affordable within these um, different health system settings. And perhaps you can just move to the next slide now because. That kind of gets to the nub of the problem, which is about the supply side work. What we are seeing is, you know, and kind of harking back to my slide, uh, well, to the slide a couple of slides ago, when we, when we actually interviewed facilities and understood who had been using caffeine citrate in the past, what we found was that in most of the instances um, of usage, um, the uh, availability, the supply of caffeine citrate was relatively limited. Um, again, you see Ethiopia on 0%, understandable. Nigeria, though, also across all the, well, the, the five cities that we, inter um, this, um, we interviewed, and none of them had um, caffeine citrate to hand, nor had they had reliable or even intermittent availability over the course of the last six months. Um, in Kenya, the story was a bit more mixed, and in um, South Africa, also um, a, a mixed picture. Um, India was really the only country where facilities were found to have regular availability of caffeine citrate. Um, I think I'll just highlight in Kenya. Basically, we're looking at just one single private Niku hospital in the capital who was identified as having a reliable supply of availability of caffeine citrate in the country. So why was that? Could we move to the next slide, please? Because let's talk about the price that was being paid. Um, you know, across countries, we are seeing extremely high prices being paid for caffeine citrate um, by the well, by, by the customer. By um, but um, in um, and there's various reasons for this. More we'll gets in a second, but these prices were particularly stark when they're compared to the alternative, um, and that is the biggest uh, that's, one, that's the biggest barrier, biggest hurdle we're talking about here. So why is that? So. In South Africa and India, caffeine is being procured on tender. That means that public sector facilities have access to caffeine citrate at prices lower than in the private sector. And you can see that in the graph on the, the right hand corner, the bottom right graph, which show the price point for caffeine citrate being, in India as being you know, relatively low, but still, of course, much higher um, than amoxicillin. Um, we saw that caffeine was not being available, um, really made available it was not available on public sector at all in Nigeria and Ethiopia, which meant that if you're buying, if you're trying to procure or access caffeine citrate in Nigeria in particular, you're going through the private sector. Um, interestingly, in Ethiopia, where we, as you explained, caffeine citrate was not available um, and wasn't on the um, guidelines or EMLs until very recently, um, the alternative product was relatively expensively priced, uh, about $1.30, uh, far higher than we are seeing in the other countries. If you move to the next slide, please. We try to understand what was driving those price points. And there's two, there's two main things here. Uh, the first one is the ex-factory price. What is the price of, the, um, of caffeine citrate coming out of the factory? And at $10, this is a hypothesized price. We'll kind of get to this a bit later on. But at $10, this is clearly very high. And there's reasons for that. The other one is the distribution cost. The sheer number of markups that occurred from that product getting from the factory gate all the way to the customer, all the way to the end user, to the preterm baby. You know, that was adding so much, doubling in many cases, the price um, being paid of cabin to And in many cases, that is simply just the middleman, those distributor fees that take place as the product moves from one um, agency to another, to another, to another, all the way down the supply chain. 
and then move on to the next slide, please, in the interest of time. But we'll explain that basically caffeine is yet another example of an M&H product that's caught in a market trap. And it's there due to barriers from a supply, from a demand perspective, and from a supply perspective. From the demand side, we'll talk about this un unfavorable enabling environment, unaligned national guidelines, no country scale-up plan to increase access. There's no such plan in any of the countries that we spoke to. We saw demand levels that were variable. Um, some high demand in some instances amongst healthcare workers, but not within the wider NICU healthcare workers that we spoke to. A lack of low levels of availability and lack of utilization. And then sadly, we, well, we see this cheaper alternative. And the economics here are key. And I think that's reflected by the, market, um, the marked price differences between the different products. And then from the supply side, we see this limited and fragmented demand, low feasibility. The product is not on government tender. So we're seeing the pushes that we're seeing are small scale in their nature and inefficient at that. There's a limited ability and poor visibility into forecasting. Governments and countries are not able to quantify their need, which makes things very difficult for a supplier to plan um, and cater to that. And from a supplier's perspective, there's a very unclear business case. Why would I, as a supplier, invest funds into the um, production of caffeine citrate and to reduce the production cost and my price? Um, when I myself am unclear of what the return might look like for that product. We see an inefficient product uh, production. Um, the suppliers are unable to produce their pro the products um, efficiently. Um, we're not seeing large batch production because, again, there's no incentive for the manufacturers to do so. And we see, you know, it's currently a very small market, unclear demand, unclear ordering, and that leads us to inefficiencies and high production costs. And then finally, when the product gets out of the factory, we see this inflation of prices in country, inflation during the distribution process, um, as uh, different cost drivers push inefficient distribution, product registration fees, and push the price higher up. Um, I'll leave you with one final slide, and no matter the time, um, just simply the ways forward. Need to, um, in across countries, we need to support the government to scale up the use of caffeine citrate. We need to ensure that demand is no longer limited and fragmented, and instead is consolidated as far as possible. And then finally, ensure that there's more availability of an affordable product. And at that point, I think it's a good segue to pass this over to um, my Italian cousin, um, Linda Stolari. Thank you. Uh, so thank you. Good afternoon. Good morning to uh, everyone. Uh, next slide, please. So um, my name is uh, Linda Storari, and I am a Global Health Project Coordinator in the Chiesi Company. And today I'm going to talk to you about uh, our approach to reducing the cost of this essential drug. The name of our project is Maisha, and Maisha stands for, uh, it means life in Swahili. Next, please. So the two objectives of our Maisha project are to provide access to care to underserved populations and to enhance health equity as a Kizi core value. Kizi is a family run company and uh, we are a B Corp benefit company and health equity is very close to our hearts. Next, please. So how do we wish to do this in our pilot project, which is uh, caffeine citrate? We want to do this by providing neonatal drugs at affordable prices and by reinvesting the limited profits that we earn in training and education. In fact, we'd like to see, in particular, when we talk about caffeine citrate, not just about providing a, a high quality essential drug, but supporting all those activities that are necessary to make sure that there is an improvement in care, that it comes in as a catalyst to change. And this is why we are also interested in, um, in supporting the training and education. Next, please. So we are already present in uh, neonatology. We started working in neonatology uh, approximately 40 years ago. We have a couple of products uh, and we are present in over um, 80 countries. Uh, with regards to caffeine, we launched caffeine in 2008 and we are currently present in about uh, 30, 35 countries. And here you can see them in pink. Whilst in green, you can see the countries which are part of our Maisha project. 
And uh, basically the Maisha project is about bringing affordable, high quality caffeine into Sub-Saharan Africa. And the first country that we wish to launch the product is actually Ethiopia. As you heard from Andrew, uh, Ethiopia does not have uh, any caffeine at all. Uh, but also we wish to uh, then um, rapidly enter into Uganda and Tanzania. And we are also evaluating the possibility of uh, entering Nigeria, which of course is a very important country, but also has very important uh, challenges. Uh, so what exactly are we doing? Next, please. This is my main slide. So um, we, as I mentioned before, we are present with 1ML Ampule uh, since 2008. And we've decided to leverage on, uh, on this uh, product to develop the caffeine citrate free ML ampule. Now, when we talk about development, we're talking about regulatory development. So it's basically um, preparing all the stability data and to showing and showing that the caffeine citrate in a free ML ampule is equivalent, is absolutely the same as the uh, caffeine in the one ML ampule. So why are we looking for this free ML ampule? Why are we going forward in this in this direction? Because we can we, in this way we can obtain significantly lower cost of goods uh, for two reasons. One, because uh, the drug itself uh, corresponds to about five to ten percent of the overall price of the finished drug, of the finished product. So basically, most of it is comes from the packaging, uh, secondary packaging, primary packaging, and the actual uh, sterility process. Therefore, by, uh, by putting into the package and into the process a free ml ampoule instead of one ml, we are going to get three times as much drug for basically the same price. But furthermore, uh, we've managed to involve our manufacturer and we have a special agreement with them in which they have significantly cut, cut their margins so that our free ml ampoule will be much cheaper than our one ml ampoule. And of course, this is the, the start is really having a low cost of goods and also having low development costs. And this is why uh, we're going in this direction. So we are now, uh, um, we have now uh, preparing the stability data. Uh, and when this is finalized and the dossier is finalized, we will be uh, going for MHA, MHRA EMA approval, which we plan to have by quarter two, 2024. And this will be sufficient to also have uh, approval in selected uh, sub-Saharan countries. And in fact, we really do hope to have the market and authorization for Ethiopia by the end of 2024. Um, so this is an important part of work, which is the, the development. And it's very important to say this is exactly the same product that is going across all of the world. So the only difference is the size of the ampule. So we're guaranteeing the, uh, the quality at a much lower price. We are also uh, supporting, we are also supporting in partnership with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the Aga Khan University uh, by giving a donation to the Kenyatta National Hospital, which is also a Nest360 hospital that has um, set up and actually already completed a caffeine implementation study. The per uh, this was run in Nairobi and the purpose was to uh, confirm the safety and the efficacy in a low resource uh, setting prior to launch and to introduce caffeine within an appropriate respiratory care and medicine safety and quality uh, improvement program and training. So going back to what we were saying before, it's not just about bringing the drug, it's about also trying to support the improvement in care. As I said, uh, the um, study has been completed and we hope to see the results published within uh, the year. Very importantly, and that is the partnership strategy, and I, I really can't emphasize this enough. Um, we are new to this uh, global healthcare project to trying to launch with a, this very different model. Um, a drug, um, we are in, um, in most of the world, but in, let's say, in fully developed or uh, medium resource countries. So this is the first time we are going uh, into uh, this low resource setting. And there is just so much that we do not understand that we need to learn. So the partnership strategy for us is very important, both at an international level and at a local stakeholders level. And therefore we are constantly reaching out and it really is inspiring because uh, so many people have the same objective that we have and that is to bring in affordable, um, caffeine to uh, to the to these patients that that really desperately need it. 
Last but certainly not least, and this is where I, I've learned that uh, big pharma people with also much more resources than us have failed, is, is the, the key is really to have a sustainable uh, um, business plan. So, the, so that we can continue, so that we can commercialize low-cost caffeine in the free ML vial, we ensure patient access, product availability, and by continuously supporting neonatal training. And the sustainability piece is extremely important because in this way, if it's sustainable, we can really uh, expand geographically. And uh, our vision is to be able to supply affordable, low-cost caffeine to uh, all of the sub-Saharan region so that uh, possibly uh, in the midterm, every baby that needs caffeine will be able to have caffeine. And uh, we're very excited about Ethiopia being uh, the first country and all the great work that has been done by uh, Andrew and the Chai team on this topic. And uh, so thank you for the opportunity to present what we're doing. And I look forward to the Q&A question session later on. Thank you. So our next topic will be on local innovation to enable caffeine usage in Ghana. Uh, the speaker for this session is Dr. Christabel Enwaronu Laria of the University of Ghana Med School and Kole Bo Hospital. Um, though she's having some technical difficulties, will Leah Greenspan be speaking on her behalf? Uh, no, I believe that uh, Christabel uh, can speak at this time. Dr. Christabel, are you there? Dr. Christabel, are you on mute? Can you come in? Were we able to get Christabel access? Yeah, Leah, we did have access for Christabel and we really wanted her on this, but it looks like her lines dropped. Um, so, okay. so my, sure, I can go ahead. Yeah. If you can, and then what we can do, just so that everybody knows, we'll get her to do a film and we'll post it afterwards um, so that you don't miss the depth of her story. But Leah, thank you so much for doing your neonatal emergency best to cover at least some of it. <laughs> All right, thank you so much. So we can we switch sides, please? Okay, thank you. I'm As you know, I'm speaking um, for Dr. Christabel, a friend of mine from Ghana, uh, speaking about local innovation. Oh, can you switch, can you switch back? Local innovation to uh, enable caffeine usage in Ghana. Okay, next slide, please. Dr. Christabel, nor I have anything to disclose. So the outline of Christabel's uh, talk is about uh, apnea prematurity caffeine from the NGO support to manufacturing, safe and quality control, cost cha challenges and next steps for Ghana. Next, please. I think we've already reviewed this, but I can briefly um, give you the definition for caffeine uh, for apnea of prematurity, which is a pause of breathing for more than 15 to 20 seconds, accompanied by oxygen desaturation and bradycardia in infants born less than 37 weeks. Uh, in red, which is critical, um, in settings without adequate technology, support for mo monitoring hospitalized infants at risk of apnea, apnea is effective preventive therapy. And this is essential. Next slide, please. So looking at treatments for apnea prematurity, we have um, the comparison um, of aminophilin and caffeine. Both have been used as stimulants for breathing in order to both prevent and treat apnea in preterm infants for decades. Both medicines are effective, but aminophilin is associated with a higher rates of toxicity and caffeine has a certain therapeutic advantage over aminophilin. Aminophilin is inexpensive and readily available in most lower middle income countries. Next slide, please. Caffeine is a methylxanthine and affects the neonate 
through stimulating neural respiratory drive, decreasing the hypoxic depression of breathing, increasing the mean respiratory rate, pulmonary blood flow, and sensitivity of the central nervous system's medulla to increased carbon dioxide. Uh, has a, caffeine has a direct effect on the myocardium, increasing ventricular output, stroke volume, and mean blood pressure with improved diaphragmatic contraction and respiratory mu muscle function. Methylxanthines adversely affect, adverse effects include tachycardia, abnormal rhythms, feeding intolerance, diuresis, delayed gastric emptying, increased energy expenditure, and seizures at high doses. I'll take a pause to see if Christabel can come in. Christabel, are you here, please? Okay, I'll keep going then. So why do we speak about caffeine? Caffeine is just safer. And I love the picture where she has the um, beans and the chemical structure on the right. So it's just safer. There's a wider therapeutic range than theophylline. It has a half-life of 100 hours versus 30, uh, has reduced rate of BPD, reduced rate of neurodevelopmental disabilities, and oral caffeine is rapidly and completely, completely absorbed, and 86% of caffeine is excreted unchanged in the urine. Next slide, please. Innovation. So let's think about understanding our circumstances, examining our capacity and taking advantage of opportunities to implement evidence-based care practices for newborns. Next slide, please. So caffeine uses in Ghana is from NGO support to manufacturing. Before 2008, IV aminophilin was the only option for treating apnea prematurity. In 2008 to 2012, Confanoche Teaching Hospital had uh, an NGO supplying oral capsid ca through Dr. Teresa Reddick. Uh, at Kofanoche, they produced oral suspensions of caffeine. Next slide, please. This has been uh, available from 2012 to current, and they are utilizing an ingenious method of purchase and distribution from tertiary centers to other facilities. The use of oral caffeine suspension in, first, in the first three days after birth is not a common practice. Here we see um, a bottle of caffeine with 30, that is uh, 10 milligrams per milliliter with a shelf life of six months. Next slide, please. In 2021, intravenous caffeine uh, became started being manufactured by Corlebu Teaching Hospital, the teaching hospital that Christabel uh, works at, is working. Next slide, please. Manufacturing uh, caffeine at Corlebu has been an existent uh, teaching hospital, uh, has been in existence for over 50 years, and is, has been inspected by the Food and Drug Authority of Ghana. Uh, Corla Blue serves as a teaching center for pharmacy students, has used deionized water plants, and has an electronic device for adjusting the pH, pH of products. Next slide, please. IV caffeine at Chlor Corla Blue Teaching Hospital uh, uses caffeine, anhydrous powder that has a USP and is produced from medicine. Medisca Inc. from the US. The powder is stored in the refrigerator to maintain its potency. Uh, you, there are other excipients that are available in Ghana and the stock solution is dispensed in 10 milliliter vials and then sterilized using wet heat sterilization method. The first batch of caffeine citrate injection was uh, produced, was sent to the Food and Drug Authority in Ghana for analysis. Next slide, please. The IV caffeine at Corla Blue is, um, is clear, colorless, sterile, preservative, uh, is a preservative-free solution. Each milliliter is, uh, contains 10 milligrams of caffeine, and the, its volume of three milliliters is packed into a 10 milliliter syringe use vial, single use vial. The shelf life is 12 months, and it is stored at a room temperature, which is less than 28 degrees Celsius. 
Next slide. Safety and quality control. This is critically important. For the production process follows good manufacturing practices. After sterilization, each vial is ins inspected with a particle viewer before labeling. The storage of the finished product is, is done in, air condition, in an air conditioned environment to maintain pro product quality during the supply chain process. Um, there is a dedicated pharmacist in the, in the clinical department that is responsible for monitoring adverse effects and it is reported or observed adverse events is reported or observed adverse events is documented and sent to the FDA for a casual causality assessment. So far, they have had no adverse events for caffeine citrate. Next slide, please. Cost challenges and the next steps. What are the challenges? Uh, vials for manufacturing IV caffeine are not available locally. They're purchased from India. Monitoring serum levels for appropriate dosing. Uh, the laboratory facility is not available, is available, but it is not affordable. As you see um, on the left, we have two vials of caffeine um, with a comparison of uh, 78 cents versus $1.72. And the next steps are to improve access to all formulations of caffeine and advocacy for early use of oral caffeine. Next slide, please. Um, Dr. Christabel is thanking the director of pharmacy at Chlorlebo Teaching Hospital, the Ghana FDA, uh, doc, uh, and uh, these two doctors, one from a uh, doctor from Confanoche, Dr. Plange Roulet, and the Department of Health at Chlorlebo Teaching Hospital. Next slide, please. And thank you on behalf of Dr. Christabel, over to you. Over to you, Leanne. Ah, over to me. <laughs> I'm still here, great. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. And I will take, I believe we have been answering uh, questions as they um, have come in. I see uh, Nicholas wants to ask a question live. Is that possible? Uh, should be possible. Nicholas, can you come in? Should be able to talk now. Oh, can people hear me? Okay. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, yeah. Thank you for a great, uh, seminar. Thank you to all the speakers, um, and the organizers and, you know, thank you for Chiesi for, for helping drive this, uh, forward. Um, I'm anxious not to be too political, but I just wanted to provide a context from um, my own perspective, having worked in neonatology for, for 30 years. Um, the reason you can't get caffeine at an affordable price uh, primarily is because it has no indication in adults. The reason that aminophilin is cheap is not that it's a cheaper raw compounds produced than caffeine. Caffeine is actually a much cheaper raw compound. The reason aminophilin is cheap is that it's produced in very high volumes because it has an indication for, for adults or children. Um, and that doesn't exist for caffeine. So there's a fundamental issue here about companies funding research, drug research in, in neonatal populations. So it, it isn't kind of true uh, that that aminophilin is cheaper than caffeine. Uh, it's it's just the market has has created that situation. Um, the next uh, thing to point out is that that caffeine has been used in neonatal settings for, I would guess, at least forty years, maybe maybe longer. Um, and the key trials that showed where it was going to be most useful, i.e. the, the caffeine in apnea of prematurity trial led by Barbara Schmidt, the CAP trial. It's important to note that that and, and other similar trials were all actually funded by governments and taxpayers. Uh, the research was not funded by the pharmaceutical industry, but the pharmaceutical industry has been able to profit um, from work that was funded by a taxpayer. Now, I'm not suggesting that pharmaceutical industries shouldn't have a profit motive, but I just want to point out that this was not a drug developed by industry. This was a drug um, that was developed by or, or 
uh, the indications were refined by clinicians. Um, I do have a concern that, that even low cost uh, production of caffeine might be too expensive for certain settings in Africa. I'm not an expert. I don't really honestly know what might be affordable. But I would be concerned that intravenous preparations might always be out of the reach um, of resource poor settings in, in, in Africa. And to me, I think it would be worthy of exploration to see whether oral formulations um, could be much cheaper. I'm not suggesting that, that you, you accept a second class quality of caffeine um, in an oral preparation, but I do imagine that you would be able to produce caffeine much more cheaply um, if it was developed purely for oral use rather than intravenous use, because the actual raw material to make caffeine is incredibly cheap. And finally, just to point out that um, going back 30 years, most of the UK used caffeine that was formulated in a single hospital in the UK. It was actually a pharmacy, a hospital pharmacy in Nottingham. And they produced caffeine and sold it to all the hospitals in the UK at a very, very low cost price. And again, uh, without, you know, underplaying the, the critical importance of Chiasian Pharma in terms of trying to drive this forward, I think it is worth considering whether um, there could be other systems that would allow individual countries to produce their own safe uh, forms of oral caffeine, which might be far cheaper than um, the margins that industry uh, might need to um, you know, charge. So say it's not a dig at, at industry, it's just asking people to think outside the box whether this system that, that you've nicely presented from Ghana could be actually developed in lots of other um, settings. Sorry to talk for so long, but uh, thanks very much for the microphone. Thank you so much for those really important points. Um, I want to, uh, is there anyone want to comment on that or should we move to the next question? Thank you, Leah. Maybe I'll just briefly comment. This is Joy here. And I just want to flag that this is exactly what these toolkit webinars are for. Um, so, you know, we, we've brought together wonderful uh, evidence and guidelines. Chai really spoke to this market gap. Um, which is utterly critical. Um, and then we need all of us. Um, you know, we need uh, WHO guidelines. We need the likes of Chai. We, and I, I, I'm so sad we can't hear from Christabel, who's been a friend for 15 years, because I think we need African and Asian-led innovation too. So I think we need all of that. And, you know, the point of this webinar is how can we move this forward together so maybe I, I pass to Andrew, because I think you can particularly speak on the market shaping thing. We need to be much more ambitious and intentional about the market shaping. Over to you. Thank you, Joy. Yes, and Professor, I, I, you know, I completely agree. I, I don't want to get into the political side of things, but you know, in terms of your, your point about the manufacturing cost of caffeine can clearly be brought down. Um, on paper, the cost of, to manufacture the product is, is very, very, very low. You know, we recognize that. And the problem is the price. You know the uh, the price that's actually getting us. So, you know there are, there are two aspects to I think any you know any strong approach to, to make this product more affordable. And um, the first one is that reducing the manufacturing cost, ensuring that the the the, the, the X factory price, the price after the factory produces the caffeine, is brought down as low as humanly possible. I mean that is very doable. Um, you know and we've seen that you know giant and other organisations we've engaged in that across a wide range of products in the past. You know, it's about ensuring that the production processes are as, as efficient as possible. It's about ensuring that there's great demand visibility. It's about um, leveraging um, demand across countries and negotiating the, the best prices. And you know, I, I think that's worth moving forward. And then, of course, ensuring that the distribution process is as lean and as efficient as possible. So you don't have that kind of that flab, that additional cost of the middlemen um, as they as they support the distribution of the product. So. Um, I definitely think that um, the, 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 well, you know there's a lot of work that can be done there. I think local manufacturing is completely right. You know, as, as, you know, as you and I have discussed previously, there's plenty of scope, and we've seen in Ghana and elsewhere towards the local manufacturer of caffeine situation. And I think that is you know, clearly where we want to see this moving, you know, um, you know <laughs> as quick as, as quick as possible. So the, the question of you know what do we do right now? Um, you know, how do we get 
put into countries like Ethiopia and, and Nigeria and elsewhere? Um, and how do we ensure that there's a sustainable local uh, production of the products that you know, are still well priced um, within um, within not all countries, but in regions of Africa as well? There's a lot of work to be done here to make this better. Thank you so much for that. I um, want to just bring up this question that uh, my colleague Jane Briggs had asked um, on whether we should be focusing on IV or oral formulation of caffeine. She is asking if there's evidence for one over the other, and it seems given the low volumes, it would make sense to focus on one formulation and oral is less challenging to administer. So um, I bring that to the panel. I wish Christabel could speak. Christabel, can you post in the chat about that? Because you're making both in Ghana. Does any, why we wait for Christabel to post, does anyone else have any thoughts on that? Maybe Andrew, this could be for you. Yeah, I'm not the best person to respond to this, but uh, yeah, I, I mean, it, it's not surprising that oral is, I think, the product, the version that, the product that's used more commonly, at least that's what we observed. Um, there are instances, particularly for um, very small preterms, um, where you'd want to, um, where I think you'd use IV. Um, but um, it's not a situation if, if the audience is thinking that it's a 50 50 split between the two products. Um, I think the volume seen, um, um, you know, tend to be far, far higher on the, on the oral side. Than the IV, and again, you can you can understand the reasons. Here. There are some products in the market as well, which are um, which are, which, are, which can be used for which in, well, uh, of course, that packaging can be used for both um, IV and oral. Thank you so much. So as we wrap up, I just um, want to uh, thank everyone for joining, and remember that caffeine is a critical element of the respiratory ecosystem especially as we uh, the world moves into um, IKMC. So I, I think that um, it, the work is incredible that everyone is doing. And I wanna thank um, our panelists and also our participants for joining us today. Um, and please visit the toolkit website for um, information regarding caffeine and for the, the next um, webinar in the uh, learning series. Um, thank you again.